the private sector has the same exact concerns or no when it comes to budget and and how much limitations they have and and how to utilize with their budgets or they're usually more concerned about the profitability of their developments i think they're more concerned about you know looking at uh, the profitability but i think they're also concerned about looking at um making sure that they understand um, that, uh, you know, for all their future projects when they're putting together perform or what have you, um, that it's going to be able to work in terms of time. Because as you know, as you bring more regulation in, and, and, and you bring that element in, you end up, you know, time is money, okay? And with money, yeah. um, you know, you, you find that it's not a good balance for them when they find out, well, if the approval process was only four to six months, and it's gone to six to nine months, they are interested and they're trying to nip that in the bud early on in organizations in, in many states um, that tackle and deal with issues. So they have a voice that can be heard and they can talk to the public authorities. They can lobby with the legislatures and find a healthy balance. Mm. Can you name a particularly complex transportation or utility project? Or actually a complex, let's start with this, a complex transportation issue or problem that we're facing today that comes to mind. I mean, certainly in the New York area, the biggest issue right now is obviously, uh, you know, freight um, and, and how freight is able to move from one point to another. And, you know, with the with, with the concerns of freight trying to get into the New York City area, um, that's why you have projects. So as, as for instance, um, the Gateway Tunnel Project, that's a very large project. Um, mm. That's one example. So that being a tunnel project for freight to be um, uh, brought in into New York, um, that is a challenge because what it does is it not only takes the trucks off the road, but then the trucks that were on the roads have to be managed in such a way to be able to go ahead and get to those freight points um, in and out without having any other additional issues. So. In the New York area, as an example, I'm, I'm, I'm giving that as the perfect example, that gateway tunnel project is certainly going to bring many jobs, but it's also going to go and it's going to bring other issues that are going to come up with respect to, you know, bringing freight off the road, but then also making sure that it's managed and it's going to the right places um, and, and, and it's able to go ahead and be managed in a certain way. So that's probably a very complex project. I can tell you right off the bat, we have a project right now in Philadelphia that we happen to be, the firm happens to be involved in, where there's actually um, capping of Route 95. There is still a demand from the public for more open space. Um, there's not enough mm -hmm. open space in a lot of areas. So they're actually capping over Route 95, um, an area in Penn's Landing, so that they can expand those open space possibilities for the public. So um, you can see, so there's demands not just on the transportation utility side, but there's also demands on the amenity side. That's a huge project um, in, in, in that area. Um, in, the, in, in New England, um, there's obviously more transportation projects going on in the Boston area, as I'm trying to give some pretty good examples, complex projects to go ahead and make uh, traffic um, or say make traffic more easy to manage. So you're seeing a lot more of those projects after the big dig. There's been offshoot projects that have happened and there's certainly several large ones right now going on there. Do you see some states being more active than others with taking initiatives to solve major problems than others not, not as active? In, in, in yes, we we have seen there is a lot. Uh, I, I would say a lot of the majority of states that are in our footprint are definitely going ahead and getting. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot, them being more proactive with regulations and what have you in, in changes. Um, we see that on the environmental end. Uh, we see that even on the design end. Um, but yes, there there because of all of the different things that have happened. In not just social media, but the buzz about you know with the climate what change or what have you, but with some of the things that have happened, um, you know, with respect to COVID, and then of course some of the storms that we've had over the last ten years. Yet we're we're seeing them being a lot more proactive than they've ever been in the last thirty years that I've been doing work. And, and do you think we'll maintain that hype, or is it going to just die out in a few years? I think the next generation is is being a lot more proactive than we ever were. I think that is not ever going to go away. I think you're going to see um, even more 
um, introduced in terms of, uh, I want to say, checks and balances, regulations, have you, um, to make sure that these issues are not going to be a problem 100 years from now. And this generation is going to be looking at that. You know, this current generation is going to look at those issues, and they're going to bring folks like ourselves in to find ways to solve that. Um, so that uh, you, they, the generations of the 22nd century are not going to have an issue. How is that proactiveness? And I know how deep you go into the uh, educational facility projects. You, you really have an extensive experience there as well. So uh, how is that proactiveness reflected on that educational facility projects? So what are we seeing there? So with a lot of educational facility projects, a lot of them now are are looking at change, change in terms of, you know, you had COVID, remote learning is a, uh, a certainly a, a major element that's going on. So a lot of them are finding ways to, to more or less, I don't want to say reinvent themselves, but enhance themselves to bring the kids back to the campus um, and also provide, I want to say, not so much amenities, but more or less variety. Um, if they're focused on a certain program, they may want to bring something that will actually benefit that program even more. It could be an amenity, it could be a lab, it could be whatever. But we're seeing a lot more concentrated um, or a concentration of focus on prog existing programs that college universities have and bringing that experience to the students, um, not just you know from a remote standpoint, but trying to bring them back to the campus so that they have uh, the, the facilities that they need um, to compete and serve the industry. And that's one thing that I will say is that, you know, the I think a lot of college universities are being more industry focused these days um, than they've ever been in the 30 years I've worked. That's very interesting because I always try to kind of envision or imagine how would the future of education be like, especially with, with the age of the technology that we're having today and whether it's going to be the same in the future or not. Do kids still need to go through the programs that we've went through or no? We're just going to, a lot of these programs will be replaced with the artificial, generative artificial intelligence or any of that. It's really, really interesting. Uh, so kids don't want to go uh, to school in person. They just want to learn remote. I think it's more of a hybrid um, mm. that that uh, kids are looking for. Um, you know, kids want to have the option. As they know, you have to have the on hands um, experience at a college university, and you're probably going to see a lot more labs, um, a lot more on hands um, uh, classroom teaching um, that these kids are going to want to experience, especially in the built environment, because um, you know that's not going to ever go away. Yes, you can get you can get the virtual experience, but you have to have a healthy balance between the virtual experience and what you're actually doing in the classroom and in the lab, um, because a lot of the, what's happening in classroom lab is going to apply to the real world. And how about schools? Did you have any experience with schools or has there any been has there been any changes projected for the school environments? So the K, K through 12, um, I can tell you uh you're you're seeing a lot of changes there as well. Um, you know, of course, everybody wants to see the kids in the schools. Um, but again, there's a focus there in terms of specialty. If a school already, let's say, is doing something such as computer science, they're going to go and find ways to enhance that experience because they may already go ahead and have that reputation that they, you know, they bring excellence. So they will look for ways to go ahead and bring, um, you know, renovations, rehabilitation, and even, let's say, new additions um, to their schooling um, to serve that purpose, you know, for that particular um let's say discipline or to particular um sector um uh, that they're so well known for and we've seen that everywhere actually in the northeast uh you know i want to switch gears here you're also an on-call engineer i'd like to know what does an on-call engineer entail so on-call contracts um, are provided by a number of different entities. It can be private or public. And typically what happens is, is that we get called by our clients and um, our clients uh, give us a task and um, we go ahead and provide a proposal. Um, they provide us uh, a, 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 a not a, a basically a, a contract um, to do that particular function and, and to see that project to fruition. And do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy that that piece of your work? Absolutely, because you know what what happens is in an on call, you establish a relationship through those task orders with your client, a trust, so you can find repeat business 
um, you know, within, let's say, an on-call, whether it be a one-year on-call or a three-year on-call um, service period, um, you know, you're really trying to, you know, as engineers, we're not just trying to solve problems with our clients, but we're getting to know our clients so that, you know, we can, you know, bring, show them we're bringing value, um, you know, to their project. So that's, you know, I, I really enjoy the on-call projects, whether it be for public or private client. You know, it, it, this is sheds the light on a really, really important aspect here. What what strategies do you find most effective in actually maintaining a strong client relationship? You know, it's 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 very simple. I mean, you know, with all of our clients, you know, it, it is is uh, it, it is being consultants. You know, there's five things that we do as consultants, right? You know, we look for the work, close on it, do it. Uh, we invoice it and we collect. I always say the beginning part and the end part is the most <laughs> difficult parts to do. Um, but to maintain a client relationship, um, you know, we have to remember those five steps um, that if we're doing all those five steps correctly, and that is when we go in our, with our clients, we got to be upfront for clients. Um, you know, in this computer age right now, we see a lot of the younger generation coming in and thinking that it's great to, you know, the hide behind emails. Now it's it's gotta be not just emails. It's gotta be calls like this where it's a Microsoft Teams call or a Zoom call. And it's gotta be picking up the phone, as I always say, and then also being upfront with the client. And being upfront means going to their office, inviting them to your office, looking at what the issues are, going over to projects, being a little bit more intimate so you establish that relationship to get that repeat work. Yeah, and, and and unfortunately, the new generations don't like that. They don't want to socialize. They just want. I don't to be... think that's. Yeah, I don't think that's ever going away. I really <laughs> don't. Not in the built environment. I I, I I highly doubt it. I think that there. Ha I think the younger generation is going to find a way to do a healthy balance between being you know behind a computer screen as opposed to being in front of your client. It's amazing because if you, if you if you add this to what you were just saying before, what what colleges and universities are doing right now, trying enticing students to come to school, to come to campus, give them a reason why they need to be on campus, uh, and the same thing. I, I mean, I I know this is also the trend at my my children's school as well, high school in particular. Is just like kids are there, but they just don't want to socialize. So they keep coming up with new initiatives to just get them to mix together and talk to each other versus just sit alienated in their classrooms and just don't bother me kind of attitude. Uh, it's incredible what the social, I, would, I don't know if we should blame it on the social media, but it's just the, the digital age that we're living in, the toll that it had on, on the kids and the new generations is incredible. We feel it at work, we feel it at school, we see it everywhere we go, just they don't want to socialize <laughs> like a different generation altogether. Absolutely. If you have, like, for instance, my child is computer science, she's perfect behind a computer and what have you. But when she gets to a company and what have you, I've told her that, you know, you, you could, there, there are companies you can work fully remote. Um, but it's never going to replace the value of, you know, picking up a phone or meeting with someone direct, whether it be your clients or your staff. There's, it's never going to replace that because that's where you get the, the, I want to say, not just the intimate relationship going, but it actually gets the hands-on relationship going so that, you know, you're, you're, you're showing, you know, the, the folks that you're with, either you work with or you work for um, the value that you bring to, to projects. Well, and, and that, you know, brings me to uh, the aspect of running a business. And, and obviously, you've been uh, pretty much running a business development role. Uh, you know, first, do you enjoy it? Do you like it? I do, because I like getting out there and meeting with people and listening to what their issues are. And then, you know, relating, as I probably said before, what their issues are to maybe the experiences I've had over the last 30 years and showing them that I I, I potentially could help them with solving their issues. Um, but I will tell you, it starts with, you know, getting out there and, and making sure you're out there to meet with people. Um, you're going to be in all kinds of different venues, all kinds of different spaces. But, you know, the best relationships that I've always met is just, you know, be going to, let's say, having a cup of coffee or having some drinks after work and to just talking to someone about maybe an issue that they have or what they do. Um, and that leads in, may lead into a much bigger venture later on. Um, some of the biggest projects that I've been involved with have dealt with that. And I've, I've been very fortunate with that. What got you to it at first place? I mean, what? How did it cross your mind that I probably need to 
try my hand at doing business or a commercial role as well, not just being an engineer? It happened about, for me, it happened about 25 years ago. I got very fortunate wow. with being given an account um, after being an engineer five years, having my, get my professional engineering license. I just got an opportunity to work on uh, a multitude of projects and um, small projects, but they all added up to a much larger account. And because of the fact that I was always in front of the client, letting them know where I was with a project, that I'd meet the deadline, that I, and I was always one step ahead uh, of where the process was. The client took interest in me, and they basically said, "Look, you know, we we want you to go ahead and take all of our projects." So that then led me to business development, where I had to meet with the various different people in this organization and be able to foster relationships with them. Fostering relationships is the most important thing about business development. You cannot do business development without fostering relationships. Those relationships may establish personal ties with those people, but those personal ties lead into um, you know, a certain level of trust and understanding. Uh, where those clients are then, you know, they're just going to pick up the phone naturally and call you before they think about who who will I call? They'll call you because they have trust and understanding of what you can do. Is that the secret recipe for being a successful business development representative or business development leader? Trust and making sure that you get you earn the trust in uh, pretty much, you know, uh, accountability and trust in front of your customers. It's trust, accountability, understanding. It's absolutely all of those things. Because if a client, you know, somebody's not going to pick up the phone uh, for you if you can't pick up the phone for them. I always say the most important thing about also being in business development is attentiveness. We don't mm. get our projects uh, through, let's say, just you know, waiting, sitting by the phone. No, it's by attentiveness. Attentiveness of being at different events picking up the phone when someone calls you, making sure, and I always try to tell all my staff, we need to make return phone calls in 24 hours. That's not just for our clients, but you know, the other most important aspect is our staff, making sure we respond to our staff quickly and we understand their needs so that we can get the projects done for our clients. Uh, do you guys also look after the, uh, you know, how, how the growth factor of these products when doing the business development, like? You penetrated a certain account, you started from a specific opportunity size, and then you doubled it in size or you tripled it. Is that something you also Please. look at? Absolutely. In a multidiscipline civil engineering firm, um, you know, if we're just starting out in one discipline, we want to expand our other services into mm. other areas with that client. So if a client brings us in an environmental project and we're working on an environmental project is, let's say, due diligence for a much bigger civil engineering project, well, we want to do the civil engineering. We don't just want to do the environmental work. So if we mm. understand if we establish that trust and we establish that understanding with our clients we will be able to go ahead and be most likely given an opportunity to provide civil engineering later on. Is it easier to do so in a public sector or in a private sector, maintain a relationship and grow it as, as you'd like to? It, it, it's That's funny you mentioned that. It, it, it's been, for me, uh, I've had a lot longer relationships um, than I've ever had with public entities. I mean, I've, I've been an, an engineer in one municipality still. I'm, uh, I'm actually the appointed township engineer in a municipality in, uh, in northern New Jersey. I've been there now 19 years. And wow. that has been through trust, understanding, reliability, and attentiveness. If mm. I'm not attentive, I mean, then I'm not considered to be reliable. So... That's what I'm looked upon in that particular municipality as their municipal engineer. Um, and I, I'm able to bring that value to them because I'm attentive and I'm going to listen to their problems. I'm going to solve them. And does that supersede the budget limitations at certain points in time? So, for instance, just because they know you, they trust you, you're attentive to their requests, you're responsive to them, you're always there versus another company who is probably new. Uh, to them at least, and who has a more aggressive uh, proposal for them. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, we encounter that a lot, um, but I find that a lot of combat, uh, clients tend to overlook price um, because they know that they'll get the value through having that person 
because they know that person will call them back and that person will address their needs and bring their project to fruition. Um, I, I've had those issues before. Some people go based on price. Some people want quality. Some mm. people just want to have someone they could pick up the phone and will call them back and speak to them and address their issue and have the trust and understanding they'll get that project done mm, on time yeah. and on budget. 